Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, where we are growing disciples who eagerly share Christ's love. It is a delightful day. I think I saw 50s. Am I wrong? That's exciting. I'm very excited about 50s. I'm almost tempted to have, take my scooter out if I still have my scooter. But that's okay. That's a different issue. Let's get to our Bible basic for this morning and introduce our theme. Today's gospel lesson reveals an angry Jesus in, a te in the temple that has become a marketplace filled with scandal. According to John's version, which of the following did not result from Jesus' actions? So according to John, which did not happen as a result? A, the sheep and cattle were scattered. B, the coins from the money changers were dumped to the ground. C, he prevented anyone from carrying items through the temple. And D, he made a whip of cords. Good luck today. This is a hard one. So how many votes do we have for letter A? The sheep and cattle were scattered. I see no votes there. How about B, the coins from the money changers were dumped to the ground? No votes there, okay? C, he prevented anyone from carrying items through the temple. We have several, I'm gonna say half there. And D, he made a whip of cords. And that leaves about, I see, bold two. Excellent. Um, all right, Jeff, our reveal for this morning is, I'm actually quite impressed. Um, C is the right answer. This is actually recorded in either Matthew or Luke or both, I don't remember. Uh, but all of these did happen according to one of the Gospels. But according to John's Gospel, he did not do that one. So it's a very uh, memorable scene. We'll be focusing on that for today's message. As we begin our worship, we start with confession and forgiveness. I would invite you to rise as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all of our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I ask you if this is your confession. If so, answer, it is. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Good morning. Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of Exodus, verses from chapter 20. God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, the day, and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land of the Lord your, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from a letter of Paul to the church at Corinth, his first letter, verses from chapter 1. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who was wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it, rise it, raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? 
but he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed the scripture of, and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord God, there are things in our lives where you call us to stand up to, injustices in our world. Help us to find courage that we can make a difference in creating positive change. Amen. So I don't think it's restricted to Lutherans by any means, but we're kind of known for being creatures of habit, wouldn't you say? So for example, how many of you could probably go to any of your favorite restaurants and say, I'll have the usual, and they would know exactly what you're talking about, right? Because oftentimes we get the same thing over and over again. For those of you who are avid walkers, how many of you tend to take the same route over and over and over again because we're creatures of habit? And that's not a bad thing. Or even here at church, I'm quite convinced that there is probably one family here that today that has actually changed pews over the last three weeks. Hello, Hallams. <clears throat> we're creatures of habit, so we, ch we don't change very often, right? Well, wouldn't it be fun to do so every now and then, just to see how people would respond? Wouldn't it be interesting to just change things up a little bit? Now, those are all instances of changing habits. What about changing um, our personalities a little bit? As many of you know, I'm a very big time Star Wars advocate and uh, one of my favorite movies and one of my favorite uh, Star Wars scenes is from episode two, Attack of the Clones. And in one of the great lightsaber scenes of all time, we have Yoda. Now Yoda, previous to this movie, we're kind of used to being this very old Jedi that can barely move and is using a cane as if his life depended on it. And in this lightsaber scene, suddenly we see him bouncing pew, pew, pew all over the place as if he's like three years old on, on Ritalin. I mean, it's just amazing to see how fast this guy is. And it was one of my most memorable scenes because it was so vastly different from what I was accustomed to. Changes in your mentality, changes in your behavior. How often do we do that? How often do we kind of step out of ourselves and change into something different that most people aren't used to? How many of you could think of somebody in your life that is typically very soft-spoken? Someone who typically doesn't make waves, that does get upset and does suddenly explode. When I think about our gospel lesson for today, that's what I think about. When I think about our stereotype of Jesus, isn't it that he is warm and soft and welcoming and gracious and merciful, this friendly Jesus. And then he shows up to the temple and is ticked off. We don't see this side of Jesus very often, do we? We might ask ourselves the question, why? What was it so bad that he erupted in such a way? And my answer, great question. Now, here's what we know in John's Gospel. Jesus says, take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. So that's what we do know from, God, from John's reading, is that Jesus did not want to see all of this stuff happening in the temple. What we can infer is more. When we look at other Gospels, all of which have this scene in them, we can infer additional stuff as well as historical information. And what we learn there is that not only was the the temple turning into a marketplace, but it was turning into a corrupt marketplace. See, it was based on the sacrificial system. What happened is all of these Jews would come to Jerusalem and for the forgiveness of their sins, which was, oh, pretty important, they had to actually pay 
for that to happen. In order to make the exchange, they had to sell stuff. They had to sell their doves and other things and be able to change the money, and they would get gypped by these money changers. It was a corrupt system. And Jesus was not a fan of that. What's important for us to note is in this story, it starts with the Passover of the Jews was near. Now that may not mean a whole lot to us as we sit here reading through that, but what that tells me is that there are a flock of Jews coming to Jerusalem because that was where they were supposed to go for the Passover. Jerusalem knew that people were going to be coming from all over, descending upon Jerusalem. There were going to be crowds. It's almost as if it was the Temple Black Friday, if you will. This was their big opportunity, right? And Jesus took issue with the abuse of this sacrificial system and just exploded. If you were there with Jesus, how do you think you would have responded? It's a very hard question, I think. I don't know how I would have. I would like to think I would have had the courage to be able to be like Jesus and say, hey, this is wrong. But I also know me better than that, and you probably know me better than that, that I'm one of those people that doesn't like to make waves. And many of us probably are that way. But my bigger question is, what would have happened if Jesus didn't? What would have happened if Jesus did not raise a, a stir about this? And he did not disrupt the money changers, and he did not make this scene. Would the corruption have continued? One thing I'm pretty confident about is that people's, uh, their imaginations and their awareness would not have been peaked. I really wonder how many of the Jews that were using the system even realized that it was corrupt. Maybe some of them did, maybe some of them didn't. Maybe they didn't realize until Jesus made this big stir that something was wrong with the system. But the point I want to make is that if Jesus hadn't done this, then there would be no opportunity to change it. Because it starts with awareness. It starts with knowing what's wrong first so that you can make the change. But it's still very so strange to look at Jesus in the way in which he responds. We're so used to the soft, gentle, kind Jesus. Maybe that kind of resonates with how we've been brought up, right? How many of us were brought up to uh, not stir things up? that we're not supposed to uh, disrupt things, that we're just supposed to be kind and get along with everybody. Maybe we might even associate losing one's anger or losing one's temper as bad. But maybe that's part of the problem. I think back to my college days I took a class called Language, Faith, Money, and Women. It was fascinating. It was mostly about how women are suppressed in many different ways. And it was the place there, it was that class that taught me about what's called the glass ceiling. How many of you have heard of the glass ceiling before? If you haven't thought about this much, basically the glass ceiling is about women that they can see what's above them as they try to advance their careers. They can see it but the ceiling will not allow them to get past it. And it's based on their gender. It was really powerful for me to think about how women were taken advantage of in these scenarios. It makes me wonder how many of us know women that are suffering from what we call the glass ceiling. This past winter, I went to a theological event for pastors and rostered lay leaders, and we learned about the LGBTQIA population. And it was fascinating to hear from people that were in that group and hear the things that they had to deal with, the, the suppression that they had, the mocking and the ridiculing that they had to endure. 
They shared about some stories about people that were not getting the same rights as, shall we say, married people. And it was just interesting to hear their experience. And it made me wonder, how many people do I know that are in this population that don't have the same equal rights as others? It's a very difficult question. Last summer, we look at a number of things that was very controversial. Black Lives Matter is one of them. And I think it's important for us to be able to talk about these things. And so often I've had interesting conversations from people uh, that talk about, well, pastor, don't all lives matter? And I say, yes, absolutely that is true. But what I'm hearing them say is they're hearing the term black lives matter because they're putting the emphasis on the black. And really when I hear about the other side of the equation, I'm hearing it not saying black lives matter. I'm hearing it say black lives matter. You hear the difference? Black lives matter as opposed to don't matter. And it makes me wonder how many of us know people that have been victimized or, or suppressed because of their skin color. Recently on my Facebook posts, I've seen some great pictures of some of our church events. And one of them that has recently popped up is from our hunger awareness meal that several of you have participated in. And it's a meal that we sponsored to make sure that we're aware that there are hunger injustices all across not only our state, our country, but all throughout the world. And that there are people that are suffering by no fault of their own simply because they were born in the wrong place. How many of us know people that are suffering from malnutrition or suffering from other hunger-related issues? People that can't get to a grocery store because they don't have the transportation to do it. We have this meal so that we can raise awareness about the injustices that exist. I also have been thinking the last few years about climate change and how it's impacting our world. And my thinking is going to so many different things that I don't know the sciences, I'm, that's not my area of expertise by any means. But it makes me wonder about all the calamities that we're dealing with, the fires and the hurricanes, and, and it, even locally, how, how is climate changing impacting our farmers, right? And it makes me wonder how many of us know people that are suffering from climate change issues. It's brought up five things. Five things that are important for us to think about. Women's issues, LGBTQIA issues, Black Lives Matter issues, hunger awareness issues, and climate change. The reason why I bring all these five up is for a reason. In a month, our synod will be having resolutions about every single one of these injustices. Our Senate Assembly is ready to move forward and say, let's have some conversation. Let's have some discussion about each of these so that we can understand these issues better, so that we can suddenly maybe be able to make a difference. That maybe we can do something about this stuff, because if we don't raise our voices, who will? These are five resolutions that will be voted upon in our Synod Assembly in hopes that our congregations, like St. John's Lutheran Church, will at least have conversations about each of these issues, knowing that there, yes, are both sides. But we must be able to hear each other in having these conversations. Now, I'm not going to go any deeper than I already have because there's way too many and not enough time. But my hope is that over the next several months or even years, that we might be able to take these issues up as a church and talk and move forward with these injustices. Being a sports fan, I saw something that I thought was amazing a few weeks ago. I saw an interview by one of the women's national soccer team players. I don't remember who it was. It was really interesting because they were playing a match and they, it was noted that those women soccer players didn't kneel in the, in the national anthem. I thought that was really interesting because they were one of the first groups that did. And they said, we're not kneeling any longer, number one, because we don't want to have this thing about we're anti-America, right? 
they're kneeling to raise awareness, but they said, we're past that stage now. We're not gonna kneel just to raise awareness any longer. We're ready to go to the next step. And that to me is something that is so amazing. That they actually want to impact change, not just bring awareness to that issue. When we have these protests that are going along around our country, they're important to raise awareness, but we get to get to that next step of doing something. And we can't do something until we actually have conversation about what we're going to do. My title is, Inaction Can Be Action. When we just let things happen, when we don't do stuff that is actually allowing things to happen, that is allowing injustices to continue. Jesus raised his voice because he wanted something to change. It's critical to the life of this church and who God has called us to be. We have so often in this past year have been trying to figure out how are we going to return to in-person worship, and we spent a lot of time on that, and for good reason, for good reason. But we have to realize the church is beyond Sunday morning or Wednesday night. We have to remember that church is about making differences in the world, about injustices. So my hope is that you will join our conversations. Bring your perspective Bring your point of view because it matters. Because your thoughts matter. So that we can raise awarenesses and maybe move to a plan that will change our world. Have courage to be the church. Amen.
I invite the congregation to rise as you are able. Our service continues with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Lord God, there is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church that your people may place their trust in nothing except for you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and our skies. Hear us, O God. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. We pray especially for Carolyn and Maggie, Terry, Tom, Arlene, Eileen, Merv, Willard, Rod, Donna, Renee, Steve, and Marguerite. Defend the victims of crime and all those who are suffering and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. We thank you for the saints who have made differences in our lives, especially for Gloria Lambert, and all of the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us and these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Just two quick announcements for our consideration today. Uh, first of all, Act 3 of the Trial of Judas will continue on Wednesday. And so if you haven't uh, gotten a chance to be, view the first two acts, um, it's actually, I would encourage you to do so if you intend to follow this series as they kind of build upon each other. Uh, those will always be re uh, left on our, both our website as well as on our Facebook site, so you can search for them, for them there. Slightly related item is in a few weeks, I'm in need of a really long, preferably black robe with a hood. So if you happen to have anything of that nature, 
uh, please let me know because we would love to have one of our characters be in costume. So uh, again, a long, preferably dark black robe with a hood would be great. All right, that's what I got for us today. Um, we conclude with our benediction. Now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God. <laughs>